Uh, we're nice one to have. All right, guys. Hi, everybody. Hi. Hey. hey, hello. We're live. We're live here from QuizWine.com. We got Ariel on the left. Uh, as many of you may know, Ariel, Fine Wine Consultant. If you ever wanted to know anything about wine, you probably reached Ari. He's probably giving you the best information ever. Thank you, Doug. We also have Gabe from Royal Wines. Hey, and, guys. And uh, we're very privileged to have him here. Uh, we're going to be trying some amazing wines today. And you're going to be getting two expert opinions and one novice opinion. Um, <laughs> and uh, that way you can make your choices. Uh, thank you guys for being here. Thanks for traveling from far. Thanks for uh, inviting me. All right. And um, we'll let Gabe get us uh, started here with uh, what we're going to try first. And maybe just tell us a little bit about what to expect. So for those of you who want to make sure that you stay tuned, you'll know that it's well worth it. All right. So we have a great selection of wines here. All the wines. Uh, here from Bordeaux. Uh, Bordeaux is uh, an exciting uh, region on each one and a little bit of where they're from and um, obviously you can find all of them on kosherwine.com. So um, let's get started. Let's do it. All right. Okay. You guys ready? I'm ready. All right. So Gabe, you want to start with the first wine that we have? Yes. Uh, so we're going to start with the right day and specifically uh, with the Chateau Soutar. Chateau Soutar here is a 2014. So it's a little bit older, just a little bit uh, than the other wines. So it's going to be uh, a bit more approachable, uh, a bit more ready to drink, although this wine uh, still has a lot of time. Uh, so the Chateau Soudar is from the saint emilion Appellation, right, Harry? That's correct. So it's a right bank wine. Right bank wines are normally um, mainly Merlot. Um, saint emilion though, however, does have a large majority of Cabernet as well. But Saint Emilion's on the right bank of the Gironde River, which, as Gabe said, is basically a Merlot country. Um, Saint Emilion has its own appellation system, so uh, they kind of think they're better than everybody else. So they created their own appellation system. <laughs> this is a Grand Cru class, so that's a pretty high up in their appellation system. Um, and this is a very, very, very nice wine. Um, as Gabe said, you know, it's a 2014, so it's going to be a little bit more approachable now, but it still has plenty of years. If you want to buy a case and drink one over the next 12 years, it's no problem at all. It's all last. So. Um, let's get rolling. Let's get rolling. All right. And um, uh, to try them in the, in the years to come. So I think we still have all three of those, right? The Malartic, the Peak, and the Yeah, they're all available. Yeah. Um, Doug's favorites. Uh, well, from, from, last, from last year. From last year's favorites. And I'm excited to try this guitar because I have not been able to try it since the KFWD. So this is a year later, a little over a year later, and get to see how it's developed uh, one year later. So what we're using on the table are these coasters, which we have, which come in every order, right, Devin? Every single order we get yeah, on the case yeah. off coasters? Every case order. Yeah. So they have a dual purpose, which I just literally realized as we're sitting here right now. So we're using them as coasters. They are the 10 plagues, or the Esfermacos. And if you turn them over, they're white. So if you want to look through your wine into the white back of the coaster, you can get a little bit more of the actual color of the wine, which is always helpful to kind of decipher, you know, the age, the grapes, um, stuff like that. So this is a very nice color wine. Um, I'm just going to get right in there. And if Gabe wants to say anything while I'm getting this wine. Yeah. Uh, those, are, those are really uh, pretty cool. We'll give you a set uh, before you leave. Oh, you know, uh, right? uh, <laughs> That's what you get for coming here. You get a set of coasters. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was well worth coming down here. <laughs> Just to get the is. Just to get the it, also, it also comes with each case you give us. So yes, you'll get true. two sets. <laughs> and as we're trying these, if you guys have any questions, please feel free to uh, set up your questions, send them to the to the live. We'll be happy to answer them along the way. Um, that's just the really, really hard ones. Those are our, our favorite ones. We'll send those to Dublin, so uh, he'll be happy to answer them along the way. Absolutely. I love the hard questions. All right, so if you want me to get on my first approach on the, on the nose on the wine, um, I'm getting a lot of um, red fruit, which are good little characters. I'm getting a lot of um, like red, red cherries. Uh, also, maybe if you go in a little bit more also towards the black fruit as well, uh, maybe some raspberries, which can kind of bridge the gap between the cherries and the blackberries. Yeah, raspberries, I get that a lot. Uh, there is some uh, a, a hint of earthiness uh, lying underneath, uh, which will come out as the wine ages uh, as part of the tertiary aromas. Uh, tertiary aromas, which in uh, old old wines and, uh, and uh, old old wines in particular, uh, come uh, come more uh, as the wines uh, uh, get some age on them. Uh, so uh, let's talk about that actually, sure. Ari. Yes. Uh, what we're talking about when we say primary aromas, secondary aromas, tertiary aromas, what is that? So primary aromas, what we're really talking about, what Gabe means, is that the primary aromas are really the first like hit of fruit that you're going to get. 
Um, you can get really a red fruit characters and get black fruit. So this for me is more red fruit. Maybe there's a little bit of a black fruit underneath, but it's not hitting me black fruit like a big Cabernet would, which is perfect. Because as we said, San Emilion is mainly going to be Merlot. So this probably has a whole bunch of Merlot in it, which would show the red fruit character. So primary aromas are really the red fruit, the fruit, but it could be black fruit, but just depending on which wine you're having. But primary aromas are fruit based. Uh, fruit based and uh, even some minerals could really be primary as well. When you go to secondary, secondary aromas are more coming from like an oak, which is something that would be brought upon the wine, something that would be added to the wine, part of the wine making process. Exactly. So you could get something like a cigar box, or you could get something like cedar or smoke even yeah. could be coming from the oak. Those are really the secondary aromas. The tertiary aromas, as Gabe said, um, is something that more that comes with age. Um, tertiary aromas are, are, are aromas that will be brought out through the wine. If some of the fruit drop away, those primary aromas, the tertiary aromas really start to come through. You'll get something like forest floor, or you'll get something here like um, almost like a bark character. Yeah, well. mushroom, yeah. leather. Uh, all those are really uh, uh, aromas that are very unique uh, to where the wine comes from, to the varieties, uh, to how old the wine is. And uh, well, when it comes to uh, Saint Emilion, it gets that uh, uh, some muskiness that is very typical to Merlot, uh, and uh, which will remind you of like you know those if if you go to the to, to the to the farmers market and sometimes they sell those uh, those wild mushrooms, uh, it, it, it's often it, it often smells uh, and tastes like that actually. Whole foods in your glass, right? Yeah. And tell me. All right, so let's see how it tastes, but um, we are probably going to be spinning because it is. A lot of wine. Yes. <laughs> it's a lot of wine. So yeah. Yes. So, yeah. Um, so, so no bracha because we're going to be spinning. So there we go. I'll drink a little. Or I'll tell you not to embarrass me. Amen. So the one thing that they tell you is that before you learn how to drink, you have to learn how to spit. So um, this is something that is you learn at art as well. Because, you know, <laughs> spit you want to get a hold of yourself. <laughs> can, be, can be quite messy, yeah. Right, so this is this is nice and classy. We have a nice between here, so you can spit inside and I have everyone's spit is going all over the place. Anyway, in terms of the actual wine. So, um, I would call this medium plus body. Um, I don't think it's overpowering in its body. I think the acid's also medium plus. I'm not just still tasting it. Which yeah, means that's that that's really it, has a, it has a long finish. Very long it's finish. very, very well balanced. Uh, it's, it's also delicate, silky. Um, very very pleasant wine. Uh, you're going to enjoy it yeah. very much if you drink it now. But I would still advise uh, that you put it away. There are many more wines that you could enjoy now uh, and that are really ready to drink. Uh, this is well worth uh, celebrating. Well worth waiting. Uh, it's going to be so much rewarding when those uh, tertiary aromas uh, come. Uh, of course, you know not everybody appreciates uh, those uh, tertiary aromas. I was actually. I, I, I'm actually also known for uh, uh, running a, a group on Facebook called Kosher Wine Sharing and Experience. It's a great group. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of you should, you should, you should follow. Yeah. You and should. Someone, someone posted uh, a couple of days ago about wine tastings, uh, wine tasting that they did in Canada, and uh, they tasted one of the wines there uh, had some of those tertiary aromas, and uh, it's uh, it smelled like you know barnyard and. Uh, uh, that's that's a typical uh, descriptor for those uh, tertiary aromas that are very uh, earthy, and uh, a lot of people say, "Oh yeah, it's got some barrier funk, but it blew off like it's a good thing." <laughs> and uh, and I was laughing because I get a lot of those inquiries. I have you know uh, people at work or uh, customers uh, uh, contacting me and asking me, "Oh, there is a, there's a weird smell in this wine." Uh, there's that uh, a, a funky taste. Could you taste it? Maybe the wine is off. And I, I smell and I taste it. And it, yes, there is those uh, tertiary aromas, those flavors of earth, of barnyard, of mushrooms. And, uh, and, and that's what I want. That's, it, it, it's part of the, uh, of the experience of the wine, mm -hmm. uh, the, those aromas. And that's exactly what I like. Uh, there's nothing off of it. I mean, you may not appreciate it. That's very much possible. That's also an acquired taste. And uh, with experience, with practicing, uh, with tasting more uh, aged wines, uh, you're going to get to those aromas and flavors, and maybe you will get to, uh, to like them as much as I do, mm -hmm. and maybe not. Uh, but uh, it's not that there is something wrong with the wine, it's just uh, the, the way uh, the wine is uh, supposed to taste. 
And, uh, and, 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 I, and I really love that. And he's and he is one percent right. The best way to learn about it, the best way to continue to to develop a palate, which is something that I myself do all the time, I think all of us do, honestly, is that the more you try, the more you see. We're trying here all these wines. Just we're going to learn more about trying wine in our palate every single time we try wine. And you can see, oh, this wine has barnyard in it. Oh, that's so interesting. That one didn't. And you know, you could learn things every single time you do it. That's just one of the things that I enjoy about doing it. And just a note on the this is the first, this is the only wine that we're going to be tasting today from the actual 2014 vintage. Yeah. Um, so I know we all kind of like forget about 2014 because 15 is like, oh my god, 15. But yeah. as a secret, also just wait for 16, by the way. But as a secret, <laughs> um, 14 was also a really, really good vintage. It came out of the hills of a 13 vintage that was not the best one in Bordeaux. So 14 was really highly rated. Um, obviously, it's not 15 and it's not 16, but still, 14 is a really good vintage to sell it. Um, to sell your vintage, I don't think it's a really drinking vintage right now, but as we were just talking about, you know, you can get a case and try one each year and see how they develop along the way. Um, good? We like yeah, so I was just going to mention, I'm noticing like some ripe fruit and mm -hmm. like, you know, not necessarily like stemmy, but like you still have a bit of ripeness, especially on the finish, even a bit in the, even a bit in the nose. Mm -hmm. um, it's funny because like last year when I tried it, I don't re recall it having that profile. So even though it's aged a year, it kind of even tastes younger than, and I know it's different settings, so some, and maybe that breed longer. So all those things uh, play, play a factor into it. And talking about the tertiary notes, the tasting we did with all the library wines and gave you were there as well. And I remember distinctly like always have the finishes of those aged French wines, and this is probably like, you know, characteristic of that is that you get like that marzipan, that nuttiness at the end. Um, and especially if you if you store them well, it really pays off. Yeah, so yeah. any of these wines that you're going to purchase, definitely store them and store them properly. And in, even in ten years, you don't even have to wait longer than that. I'm assuming ten years, uh, you, it will it will pay off handsomely. Okay. So I think what we should do is let's move on to the second wine, and at the same time, we'll just say no because Doug just said about celery. So game around, just maybe talk about litter and what is important to sell it. What do you need to have a good seller? If you want to drink. Let's say the next one, the Fontenelle that we're going to have in 2015, if you want to have it in 2025, what should you do to ensure that that wine is still going to be good as, 2000, as the years go on? Okay, so wine storage, that's, uh, that's always a very important thing. Uh, okay, sorry. No problem. <laughs> and I'm sure we're going to be getting questions. Before you jump in, I'm sure you're going to be getting questions. So I'm just going to hop online here and try to take a quick glance at some notes that may be coming in, and that way I can bring up the questions as, as they roll in. So. Uh, go ahead, continue, and uh, if I see anything, I will, I will bring it up. Wine storage. Uh, how you should keep uh, your wine so it will age properly, so uh, it won't go bad uh, with time. Uh, I mean, a lot of people just you know, keep their uh, wines around the kitchen cabinet or something like that, which is the, the worst place to, uh, to, to store your wine. Now the kitchen terrible. gets hotter than <laughs> any other room in, uh, in the house. And uh, wherever you, you, you store your wine in, in the house, I mean, unless you keep your uh, air conditioning on, on uh, below 60 degrees uh, year round, uh, that's, a, that's a terrible idea. And nobody, of course, uh, does that. Uh, so uh, one of the options, the first option, which is not so recommended, uh, is that if you have some cool place in the house where there's not, not much uh, fluctuation in temperature, uh, that's, uh, that's, that's, that's where you could uh, store a few bottles if you really cannot invest uh, in, a, in a more uh, appropriate uh, uh, aging, uh, aging tool. Uh, like when I, when, when I, I said, excuse me for a second, I'm going to close the window. Yeah, K would be great. Not everyone has one. Exactly. Uh, and what, what I'm talking about, an aging tool, uh, yes, so a wine fridge, a wine cooler, yeah. uh, you can get one for like a hundred uh, bucks, and then fifty bucks uh, for like twelve dollars, eighteen dollars. Uh, I mean that's that's pretty small, but it's a, a but it's a start, uh, and uh, you can set the temperature to uh, 53, 55 uh, degrees, and uh, that's where you could uh, you could store some very very special bottles for a very special occasion uh, to enjoy. And I agree with you, I'm gonna cut you off. Keep on. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing fine. Keep going. Of course, and you can upgrade and get you know bigger uh, fridge. Uh, there are a uh, handful of uh, recommended brands uh, that make uh, you know wine coolers for hundred bars, for two hundred bars, uh, and so on. We're not going to say their names until they give us free ones, though. Exactly. <laughs> or you could, uh, if you have a small room that you could isolate in your house. 
uh, and put maybe an air conditioner in uh, that would uh, function all the time uh, to keep it uh, to keep it cool. Uh, that's a solution. It's not ideal, but uh, it's uh, it's already better. And of course, if you can invest uh, the money, uh, but that's not a bad idea because it could uh, add a lot of value to your house. Uh, you could build uh, a cellar, but that would set you at, at least fifteen, twenty thousand yeah. uh, dollars. That's a uh, that's a quite the investment. Yes. So you, you, but you if might, you do, we you might need another. Air. You might need another mortgage. <laughs> yeah. <that. laughs> yeah. So, so if you're doing, if you're going with that air conditioner uh, option, you probably want to put a humidifier in there as well. Yes. yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. You need a humidifier. You need a new humidifier. I, the way I look at storage, um, I basically is exactly what Gabe said. Um, there's really four four things in storage that I think are essential. One is light it should be dark, preferably dark if possible. Balls on the side. Yeah, it should be away from away from a lot of sound. Mm -hmm. it should be away from vibration. So if you live near a train, like a lot of people do, like you should try and keep it away from the vibration. And two, like Gabe said, is the temperature. So the temperature, if you can keep it anywhere between like 52 and 56 degrees Fahrenheit, probably preferably closer to 52. Honestly, yeah. um, it'll be you'll. The, the most important is the temperature fluctuation. It's better to have uh, a cellar, a place where you're going to keep your wine and it's at 60 degrees, but it stays at 60 degrees, than the place that it goes from anywhere between, say, 45 degrees to uh, 56, 58, and it goes up and down all the time. That's not so good. Better that it's a little bit higher than that even, uh, but it's stable and, uh, and doesn't change more than one, two degrees. Uh, every few months. Perfect. Awesome. All right. So let's move on to the second one. Okay. Um, the second one that we have is uh, Gabe. Why don't you tell us a little bit about it, and then we'll we'll try it together. Okay. So this one is very very interesting. Uh, this is Chateau Fontenil. Chateau Fontenil from the Fronsac Appellation. The Fronsac Appellation is the lesser known uh, appellation of the right bank of Bordeaux. It's uh, north of Pomerol, which is. Uh, uh, like borders on the exactly, table. yeah, and then you have Saint Emilion. Mm -hmm. uh, the the the, the Fronsac appellation is also using like the rest of the of the right bank, uh, mainly Merlot in uh, in the wines. Uh, although from uh, what I recall, uh, this wine is 50-50 uh, Merlot and Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh, this estate Chateau Fontenil is owned by uh, Michel Roland. Michel Roland is arguably the most famous, the most uh, sought after uh, wine consultant, uh, enologist, winemaker uh, in the world. Regardless um, of kosher or not, just in the world. Exactly. <laughs> he works at literally like 150, maybe 200 wineries all over the world. He travels all the time. Uh, he advises wineries uh, all over to how to make in Bulgaria, <laughs> in That's California, true. in yeah. Israel. Yeah. Uh, he, he really works uh, everywhere. Except that here, that is his winery. He owns it, he makes the wine himself. There is no consultant winemaker there. Uh, he's the owner, he makes all the decisions from uh, beginning to end. Uh, and uh, and that's that's a wine that truly reflects uh, his style. Uh, he likes those uh, fleshy, powerful wines uh, that are very rich and velvety. Uh, and uh, that's exactly what this wine uh, is. It's also like riper. Uh, All right, I'm excited. Let's try. Basically, basically, <laughs> yeah, <we got> <laughs> you're bridging a gap between the new world and the old world style-wise. Awesome. Okay, and this is also this is the first release, I believe, at least of kosher. It's yes. the first release yeah. of uh, the kosher wine from Chateau. Mm -hmm. Yes, so very exciting. Uh, this was also at the KFWE this year, uh, so people who were there were able to try it then. I had it. This is definitely um, my. It was if not my. It wasn't my top wine because uh, we don't have my top wine here, but that's fine. Um, it was my. It was my second or third choice. I'm pretty sure we we uh, we were live there. Yeah, we, yeah. We, yeah, we talked about, about this wine. We talked about the all the awesome wines that we tried at KFWE. Um, I, we're just, we're rebating KFWE, but let's just. Just a little bit. I know we already had it, but KFW is the kosher food and wine event that everyone puts on every year. It's a must um, attend. Yeah, event. like you got it. This is the best go. kosher event that I've been to. They do one in Miami, one in. Uh, I mean, they do all over the world. Well, in the, the U.S., Paris, Miami, Miami, right? Yeah, they do in, in, in Israel also. In Israel, yeah, they do in Tel Aviv, in London. But in the U.S., there's Miami, there's Los New York, Angeles. and L.A. LA. And L.A. is my favorite one to go to, just because I love L.A. Yeah. Um, and you get to be on a rooftop. I haven't been to the one in Miami. Uh, but New York is by far like the biggest one and it's the most like hustle bustle and you get like the food and the wine. It's just an amazing event. 
uh, to go to whether you like food, whether you like wine, especially if you like both. Or me and me, because you'll see both of us there. So it's like us, you can be like, yeah. this, year, this year's event was amazing. Yeah, this year's event was awesome. Okay, let's talk about the wine a little bit. So, I actually already noticed, if you just look a touch of the color on this one, it's funny because I actually think this one is a touch more towards the brown side than the Chateau Soutar, which again, it's not a bad thing. So let's, I guess let's talk about color for a minute because I know I get a lot of people who ask me, what about the color? I see brown, what does that mean? So when, when you see a wine and you look through the wine and see the colors, there's really two parts of the wine that I'm looking through when I try and look at a color. I try and look straight through into the center of the wine to see the color that way. I decipher a color based on the center of it. And then I also kind of look at the rim on the outside. So what the rim on the outside will tell you is if the color in the middle is the same as the color on the outside, you're really more looking at a wine that has a lot of youth on it, a wine that's pretty young, um, also could tell you a little bit about it. Now when you see a wine that has a little bit browner on the outside, it does not mean that the wine is going bad at all. That's not at all what it means. Um, it just means that the wine is showing a touch of age. Now this is a 15, so really technically it's three years past vintage, but showing the touch of age is not a bad thing. Um, it doesn't mean that the wine is going bad. It does not mean that the wine can't sell it for another 10 years. Mm -hmm. It just means that the wine is showing a little bit more. Now, I'm looking at it again. I'm not getting as much as I thought the first time, but maybe there's like a little bit of a tail uh, right on the outside. So again, not a bad thing. It does not mean the wine's going bad at all. It does not mean the wine wasn't stored well. That's all. That's all. It really means just showing a little bit of age. Exactly. Okay. Also, it makes sense because this wine uh, is a bit you know, riper than the average uh, in Bordeaux and the ripest of the of the six that we have here uh, is 14.5 percent alcohol, which is uh, an alcohol level that you will see more often in California wines, in Spanish wines, in uh, Israeli wines, and uh, so it's got more sun, more ripeness to it, and that ripeness uh, will usually come at the expense of the structure, uh, of the, the tannin structures in the wine, that uh, allows the wine to age for the very uh, long haul. And that is not a bad thing in this case, because sometimes you don't want to wait forever for your wine to be ready. Uh, not all wines should, uh, should be aged for 20 or 30 years. Uh, 10 years is also very good. And uh, that means that this one is going to be approachable probably sooner, ready to drink sooner. And, uh, and you will be able to uh, enjoy it at its peak uh, in a few years' time. And I actually agree with that because you'll see, you're going to smell it now also. If we compare it to the 2014 that we just had the Sutar, and this one, which is the 2015, I think this wine is more approachable now. Mm -hmm. I mean, you get more complexity of flavor, you get more of the tertiary notes that yeah. we were talking about a little bit before. Just because the fact that it's a 2015 and the Sutar was a 14 doesn't necessarily mean that, oh, this wine is, is young, but you can't drink it. This one is approachable now, right now. Um, could you age it for five to eight years easily? Easily. Yeah. easily. But easily. I, you could still open a bottle now, decant it for an hour, um, let it breathe for two or hours or whatever, and you could absolutely drink this one right now. I actually really, I, I really have to like the, the nose a lot. I'm, on, I'm still getting a lot of the red cherries that you talked about, yeah. red fruit on the last one, like cherries, raspberries, even maybe a little bit of cranberry. But I actually, I'm also getting like, uh, you know, like those little red licorices. Yeah. Like I'm getting a little bit of a little red <laughs> licorice in here also. Like it's, it's a really nice nose, but it's complex. And there's a lot to it. Um, there's, um, you know, there's also complexity aroma. I guess like aroma. chocolate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the chocolate aroma. Chocolate is a secondary. Yeah, aroma. exactly. I was just gonna say, so yeah. the chocolate aroma could be coming from the fact that they spent 18 months at home, so it could be coming from that. Um, and listen, if you're gonna pair a wine, actually. I know it's totally case up with it. So if you're gonna pair a wine with matzo, not necessarily any one of these mat wines would be phenomenal. For matzo, this probably would be the best because of the fact that it's already so approachable now. There's already more depth to it and more complexity. Do not hit the spittoon. So therefore, it would be a lot, a little bit better to go with matzo than I think a wine that would be super close. So if you're having matzo and you want to have a wine, this is your go-to. This is the wine to go. All right, with. let's let's go ahead. We still got four more wines to try. Mm. Uh, and there's a lot of education packed in there, so <laughs> for people watching this now or later, you're, you make sure you sit down with a nice glass of wine and, and carefully take notes. And if you actually have one of these in your cellar, you can open it up and you can try it with us. Yeah, you can I was about to say that, actually. I spit first, that's why. <laughs> great, great wine speed color. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So there's four more wines, you can see them right in front of us. You can pause the video, you can go grab one, you can open it up. Um, and you can try it with us. And you can say, and someone says, you're opening the wine way too soon. You drink it with professionals. So this is, an, and this is educational. So therefore, it's okay. You're allowed to do it. Plus, you can buy more from us anyway. Well, you can drink those later on. Um, all right, so in terms of the wine. So actually, this is a much fuller map. I get a lot more to this. Um, 
there's more complexity, there's more roundness. Um, I'm getting more of the tan structure than I did on the sutar. I think the sutar is, is like is just a little young. This is really ready to go close to it. Um, there's tan is a really nice the finish, also still pretty long. Yeah, it's a, yeah. So and I think that's really tan. Also, the 18 months in, in French hole could be could could go to that. Also, um, if we're getting real geeky for a minute, um, the Franzac region compared to the rest of the regions that we have on the table. It doesn't have the same pedigree, doesn't have the right. same moustache, doesn't have the same depth of the flavor and complexity. So therefore, when the grapes aren't as, I guess I'm gonna use the word cluster, but they aren't as, you know, they're not as important, they're not as, um, they're not as prominent, I think so. So therefore, the oak will play a larger factor in the wine, it will make it a little bit more chewy. Um, but it's still a very nice wine. It's still a wine that you can drink right now. It's also complexity flavor pair with matzo. So yeah. And let it breathe. I would definitely let this breathe uh, for a couple breathe. of hours mm -hmm. at, at a minimum. Yeah, two to uh, three hours in the yeah. would be perfect. All right, let's let's awesome. uh, let's move on. Okay. Uh, guys, grab your grab grab the spittoon. Pass it back over to my side. Yes. Okay. So um, all right. Uh, briefly, let's uh, let's introduce the next wine. Chateau Faya. So uh, Pomerol is uh, the third appellation uh, in uh, in uh, in the right bank of Bordeaux that we we're talking about, which is uh, probably the most driven, uh, the most mellow driven of the three. Uh, many of the wines in uh, saint have, uh, have a lot of Cabernet Franc, other varieties, uh, a bit of Cabernet Sauvignon, a bit of Malbec. Uh, Usually, Pomerol, uh, many of the wines are 100% Merlot or 90%, 95% Merlot, just a little bit of Cabernet Franc, sometimes Cabernet Sauvignon, but that's about it. Uh, I think this one is actually 100% Merlot, I'm not 100% sure, uh, but uh, we'll tell you it, 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 it's pretty much up there. <laughs> Something very important, I get a lot of, uh, many, many times I hear, uh, Merlot is not as, um, is, is not as you know, prestigious or as harsh of, as, uh, as Cabernet Sauvignon, uh, it's like a secondary grape. Well, first of all, Merlot is the most planted variety in Bordeaux. That's correct. Uh, uh, another thing, you mentioned uh, rootstock before, uh, we mentioned terroir. Uh, Merlot grows in many, many regions all over the world. It grows in California, it grows in Israel, it grows uh, basically everywhere. Uh, and, uh, but the right bank of Bordeaux, and especially Pomerol, is known as like the kingdom of Merlot, where the, this grape shows the best. And some of the best, most expensive wines in the world are actually uh, based on the Merlot grape variety. And uh, the wines are great, they can age for many, many years. Uh, one of those famous wines, unfortunately, uh, it doesn't exist in kosher. Uh, well, even if it did, it would cost a fortune because it's already a fortune. Uh, when, uh, when it's non-kosher, it's Chateau Petrus. Yes. Uh, maybe you have heard of this one uh, in movies, in TV shows, uh, in books. Uh, it costs sometimes $2,000 a bottle for a new vintage. Uh, and, it's um, and it's Homerol. And Pomerol is a very, very small uh, appellation, very, very small region. Uh, you can basically walk uh, from one winery, one chateau to another. Uh, they're all within a, uh, within a walking distance from each other. Uh, sometimes it's just across the street, and uh, and so you have that great terroir, and uh, some of those uh, wineries are more well known or uh, more recent than others. Chateau Faya is pretty recent; uh, it's been around for about uh, 15, 20 years, something like that, uh, and yet it's getting a lot of uh, a lot of press. Uh, very, very good wines. Uh, it's uh, providing a very good, uh, very good quality. It's a very uh, modern building. Like if you're going one day to go tour Bordeaux. Uh, on vacation or something like that, uh, you have to visit this winery because it's a very different building. It's not one of those castles uh, uh, from the, the 16th century uh, that you have for uh, many uh, many of the properties there. It's a very modern building, uh, so uh, it's a, it's a really interesting wine. What are we going with um, Hopefully, we'll go in May. You want to come? I think so. Okay. <laughs> I won't. I, I may not go without you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm actually also planning to go either late May or early June. We go with Gabe. Yeah, yeah we, should, we, should, we should go all together. We'll do a video from there, guys. Remember, <laughs> May, whatever, check in at 1 o'clock. We're doing a live video. Check so far. In May. In May. In May. 1 o'clock in May. 1 o'clock in May. <laughs> Just mark your calendars now. All right, so check so far. This is also the first time that they made a kosher run, right? Yeah, it's the first time, absolutely. Mm. 
All right, guys, and I think after we try this one, we'll take a few minute break, let people uh, adjust, and then we'll we'll get back on to the last three. So we'll take a quick intermission. So let's, let's go through this one and uh, stay tuned, but we will be taking a break after we give you a, a few quick notes on this. Sure, so this one also has a similar color, actually, I think, to the Fontanelle, even though it's a little bit sub more southern of the region. Um, it has a touch of a brown on the outside, but again, not a bad thing. It's, not it's, 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 it's brighter in color, no. much brighter. Like, Deep ruby, deep ruby. I would call it actually. What do you mean? You would call me in ruby, but yeah. To me, dark this, color. Yeah, to me, this deep is looking dark, much, darker. much thinner. This is looking almost like a like what you would see in a roan, like a lighter, not as light, but yeah. The, so the, the way I do it is if I can see my fingers through it. Um, if I can see my fingers through it, I always usually call it either light to medium. If I can't see my fingers at all, I'll call it a deep color, whatever color we're calling it here. And he said, "All right, I think I would go with that also." But yeah, um, because it's, I would call it dark. See, I think I get similar characteristics on the nose on this one than I get on the other one. I think what we're showing from the bright bait is a lot of red fruit. Yeah. I'm getting much more red fruit on this one as well. Stay tuned for the next three. The next three are all from the left bank. So the left bank is going to show a lot more black, but let's concentrate on what we have here. I'm getting a lot of red fruit here. Yeah. Also cherries. Actually, getting a little more strawberries. It's, it's, it's very uh, right thing to get in the middle of those, uh, those red fruits. Uh, you have some wines also in the left bank that are sometimes merle driven. Uh, Chateau Condissas is one of them. Mm -hmm. Uh, there, uh, even though it's also the same barley and it's not so far, it's like it's a, it's a few miles away at the end of the day, uh, you'll get a more black blackberry uh, profile. Uh, it really shows that uh, the elevation, the soil, uh, the, the microclimate of each uh, specific uh, regions, uh, each uh, appellation uh, will change the, the profile of the wine, and that's why. Uh, I encourage not to generalize too much uh, when you talk about a, a garden and say, oh, I love Cabernet Sauvignon, or I love Merlot, or I love Shiraz, or I love this, or I love that, because uh, each and every great variety uh, can uh, showcase a different profile, a different style, different aromas and flavors, uh, depending on where it comes from, on the style of the winery, the winemaker, Etc. Uh, Etc. Et and this is a perfect example. What I think of where you see terroir in a great and wine, right? Now, and just to, to that point, we uh, oh, we did <laughs> we did a tasting at City Winery, and then here in, in the area where we showcased our chosen Merlot Syrah, which is 100% Syrah, and the Hermitage, which is also 100% Syrah, one from France, one from Israel. Crozet Hermitage, total Crozet Hermitage, totally different. Uh, taste profiles. You have the Hermitage, which is a lot more earthy, and and those the, that profile. And you have the Syrah from Israel, which was fruit. Mm -hmm. Both hundred percent Syrah. Mm -hmm. What you were just making tasted mm -hmm. totally, totally different. We we uh, as people came up to taste, we gave them both of them, asked them which ones they liked. Um, the, the market here is very into the Israeli wines. Most people prefer the chosen barrel or sort of Syrah, but for those who've already you know have a have a wider uh, you know a wider range of of, of taste that they enjoy the Crows Hermitage is also a great 100% uh, Syrah wine. Mm -hmm. Right, and what I would say about both of the, what we're comparing here with the Fayette from Camarol and the Crows Hermitage from the Maroon and Rhone, um, they're both very true examples of what a grape can do when they're in their home territory. So Crows Hermitage in the Northern Rhone is really the home for Syrah and where it was born and where it really showcases its perfect variety of true character and it's the same for Pomerol and Merlot. Um, when you go to Pomerol, I mean, this, is, it's, this smells like the clay that it was the soil where the grapes were grown. Like, it is a perfect example of what terroir is in a wine. Um, like, you can almost, like, close your eyes and feel like you're there. You can see yeah. the clay, you can see these little tiny Merlot berries. Like, it, it's perfect. Like, it's, it, this is really, really a beautiful wine. It's composed well, there's no over alcohol, there's no over acid, it's got a long finish, there's a lot of flavors, and it's a baby. So you can go keep it for the next 10 to 15 years without a doubt, follow the instructions of the how to sell it, and you'll have these beautiful wines for the next 15 years. All right, guys, we're gonna take a quick break. So join us back, we'll be live to showcase some nice three wines. Thank you, Ari, thank you, Gabe, for now. See you soon. We'll be right back. <laughs> 